Welcome to my fifth video on reinforced concrete design based on Eurocode 2. Today we will look into the limit state design. We are using the same textbook. The topic is limit state design. Let us start with the purpose. Limit state design is meant to ensure that the structure is safe even when it is under the worst loading condition. The other purpose is to ensure deformation is not too excessive under normal working, normal working conditions. This means we don't want the floor to sink each time we walk on it like a sofa or the building to start vibrating even in a breeze. If a building shakes in a massive earthquake, all of us will understand. But it should not happen, but earthquakes are not normal working conditions. Buildings should not vibrate under normal situations like when people are opening or closing doors. One important part of the limit state design is the factor of safety. It is a number larger than one which we use to make the structure safer. There are three ways to do this. The first is called the permissible stress method. In this method, we take the ultimate strength of the structure's material and then divide it by a factor of safety. The result is called the design strength. If the design strength exceeds the loading, then we are convinced that the structure is safe. To put it in other words, we underestimate the strength of the material in order to get a safer, safer environment. The other one is called the load factor method. This time, we multiply the working load by a factor of safety. The result is a design load. If the design load is lesser than the strength of the structure, we can convince ourselves that the structure is safe. Finally, we have the limit state method. It is. It has factors of safety for both the strength and the loads. This is why we call it the partial factor of safety. We basically multiply the working load with a factor and divide the strength with another factor. If the factor strength is larger than the factor load, then the structure is safe. This is why Eurocode 2 favors limit state method. Let's go to a visual example. Suppose we want to design the cable system to lift the big shaft shown in the picture. Let us start with the permissible stress method. We get the design strength by dividing the total strength of cables by a factor of safety. In, by doing that, we are building redundancy system into the system. Then we compare the design strength of this cable system with the weight of the shaft. The weight of the shaft can be estimated based on the amount of material used to fabricate it. If the design strength is more than the weight of the shaft, we can comfortably, com comfortably say that the system will work. This method enables the system to work even if the cables happen to be weaker than specified. Next, we look at the load factor method. We get the design load by multiplying the estimated weight of the shaft. In doing so, we are assuming that the shaft is heavier than it should be. If the strength of the cable is still bigger than the, heavy, than the weight of the shaft, we are convinced that the system is safe. This method provides a safety margin on, for errors in the estimation of the load. Finally, we have the limit state method. Like the first one, we get the design strength by dividing the estimated strength with a partial factor of safety. Then, like the second example, we multiply the weight of the shaft with another factor of safety. Then, if the strength is still bigger than the load, we consider the system to be safe. This is how the limit state method works. It caters for the uncertainty in the strength of, of the system and the load it carries. Now we have seen that the safety feature of the limit state design. Let's go back to the basic. What is the objective of the structure design? First, we want to make sure that the structure will not become unfit to use within acceptable probabilities. 
This means there's no use if the structure is still standing, but it cannot be used for its intended purpose. The phase acceptable probability means it, that we are still subjected to the laws of probability. We can only work towards high probability of success, not absolute success. Our design must be our design must keep the structure within its limit state. What are limit states? There are two types. The first is the ultimate limit state. The second is the serviceability limit state. Let me start by exp explaining the lim ultimate limit state. The first criteria is it must not collapse with adequate factor of safety. This, the face adequate factor of safety means we are not just interested in getting not the structure not to collapse. We want a huge margin of safety. Account for possibility of buckling and overturning. A structure that is, does not collapse is not good enough if it buckles or overturns. We want to guard against that as well. Finally, account for the possibility of accidental damage like internal explosion. We do not wish for accidents, but we must cater for them in our design. Serviceability limit state. The first item here is deflection. You may not notice it, but all buildings sway when blown by wind. It is only that the amount of sway is so small that the occupants barely notice it. When we check for the serviceability limit state, we look at things that may not cause the structure to collapse, but it might cause discomfort to the occupants, like huge deflection. One example is building swaying excessively. The other is beams deflecting visibly. No one likes to live in an apartment where, when your neighbor above you comes home, you can see your ceiling sinking down. Deflection can never be fully removed, but it can be reduced into non-noticeable amount. Next is cracking. Nobody likes to see cracks in their building, even when they are, we are told that it is safe. Again, through design, we can limit the cracks width into microscopic size and therefore not noticeable. Durability, it should be quite obvious because we consider our real estate as non-perishable item. This has to do with the protection of reinforcement bars against rust. Excessive vibration, this is related to industrial or buildings that stores machineries like motors or pumps. Nobody, want, nobody wants the whole building to vibrate each time somebody switches on the machine. Fatigue happens when we load and unload the structure repeatedly for a long time. This cannot be helped. Imagine yourself leaving your house for work or school in the morning and coming back at night. Your floor slab gets loaded and unloaded cyclically every time for years. Structural design has to consider this. Fire resistance is another critical factor. Reinforcements can get weak in high heat. There are also special circumstances like earthquake typhoon depending on the location. Let me now introduce the concept of characteristic strength. What do we mean when we add the word characteristic in front of the word material strength? We need, what we need to know the material strength and we find, it, find out by testing sample. The problem is, depending on the sensitivity of the testing measurement system, it is very likely that all the samples will record slightly different values. We can average them up, but we cannot use the average value to calculate our design because by definition, 50% of the samples will register a lower strength than the average. So we have to create a new term called characteristic material strength, which means the strength which we expect most samples to be tested higher. How do we get this number? The answer lies in a statistical concept called normal distribution. This is the normal distribution curve. In this scenario, x-axis represents the strength of the sample and y-axis represents the number of samples. Unless the material is badly made, the individual test results will always congregate around a certain value which we call the mean strength. This is the average value. 
If we are to use this value in our design, then half of the samples would have registered a weaker strength. Therefore, to play safe, we need to use a lower value which we call characteristic strength. We get this by taking the mean strength and deduct by 1.64s, where s is the standard deviation of the samples tested. So the relationship between characteristic strength and mean strength is this. Both F, M, and S can be calculated from the test samples. By using F, K, what we mean is we can expect 95% of the samples to exceed this value. To put it another way, we are 95% sure that the material we use exceeds this strength. That is the definition of characteristic strength. We shall stop here by now. I'll continue in the next video.